So this is one of those times where a video is taking me a lot longer to make than I expected. But then I remember, I can just make low quality content. So you're in for a slideshow today. I think these are good for things that I'm either thinking a lot about and I'm quite eloquent on, or things that are very pertinent. Now, the British election coming up early next month, very pertinent because this has been a bit of a roller coaster ride. We weren't expecting it so soon. We thought it was going to be announced in the autumn, while the leading Conservatives had time to run a campaign, announce a bunch of things like pension increases and tax cuts to get people to vote for them. Of course, they'd only just pull the rug out from everyone afterwards, but they didn't even give themselves the time to do that. The Tory party are committing suicide, and this gives massive implications that we can actually predict, I think, quite accurately over the next 10 years by just looking at the current parties, where they stand, what they stand for, and if they'll be able to actually get anything done over the next 10 years, the next two election cycles. So with that, we'll start off by looking at the Conservatives, nicknamed the Tories. They've been in charge for 14 years. In this time, the country has dropped massively. The quality of life right now is seriously sinking quickly, all because of them. I used to obviously not quite like the Tories, but I'd give them somewhat of a free pass. Until you think a political party that's been in charge for 14 years, at what point do you recognise that the chances they've had to fix everything that's wrong are just unbelievable? That means they've deliberately chosen not to. To make the country worse has been a deliberate policy choice of theirs. They are seriously scum who deserve nothing but unbelievable punishment this election and more. They should actually be exiled. Any any Tory frontbencher should have all their titles removed and fucking kicked out. So, unanimously hated and distrusted. I hope my contempt for them comes across. The left has always hated them because they believe they represent the rich, Nazis, white, you know, all the, all the enemies of um, progressivism they see in the Tories, which is, for one, delusional. The Tories are basically unidentifiable from Labour in terms of their policies, but people go off of vibes so much in British politics and it does my head in, but that's where we are. What they're currently campaigning on is what won them a massive majority in the 2019 election, which was make everybody scared of the Labour Party. That worked in 2019 because between 2015 to 2020, the Labour Party was led by a man called Jeremy Corbyn, who was very radical, very socialist, and his base became massively woke communist university students. That's not the case anymore. For the last four years, the party's been run by a man called Keir Starmer, and we'll get onto him and why he's very different in the next slide. But every possible metric that the Tories have ever promised to make better, such as housing prices, pensions, inflation, taxes, and immigration, all of those things they've made worse significantly. Every single time they've run, they've run on those platforms and made everything worse. And because of that, we are going to see, I think, the biggest downfall in British parliamentary politics, possibly in history, probably only rivaled by the old parties like the Whigs and the Liberals. The Conservative Party is not going to survive this election in the same form. They're probably going to rebrand, they're probably going to reshuffle a bit, but they are going to not be a serious force for a very long time. Because we demand zero seats for the Tories. That's the goal. I need everybody to will that into existence. Channel your mental energies. They don't win any, a single seat. That's the plan. So, Labour are going to win, essentially. They're the other major party of the top two in this country. Well, a lot of people don't realise just how socialist this country was in the post-war era until Margaret Thatcher came along. She massively changed the paradigm of British politics, and since then, Labour have realised they can only win when they're not left-wing, or at least not socialist. This is what happened with Tony Blair. Tony Blair came in pre presenting himself and his cabinet as sensible, competent centrists. That is what they're trying to do again with Keir Starmer. Farage called him Blair without the flair, which is probably quite true, but can you argue Blair had any flair in the first place? Now, the, the way that they are able to properly present themselves as competent, sensible centrists is attacking the Tories from the right for 
raising taxes for regular people, for the immigration that they say is out of control. And this is, this is the left-wing party saying the immigration because of the Conservatives is insane and we're going to actually control it. Of course, they do have some bad economic policies. They want to nationalise things like uh, the rail services and energy. But you'll see in the brackets here, don't jump down my throat. This could honestly be a better thing long term than what we currently have. Right now, those services, rail and energy, are neither private nor government owned. And that is the worst of both worlds. We talk a lot about how the tragedy of the commons is such a key reason for why public quote unquote goods don't actually work if they are truly public. When you say everybody owns something, then it's a race to deplete that resource before everybody else does. And then no single person has the responsibility to replenish this resource and maintain it. Now, look at our rail system, where we have private rail companies who own and operate the actual trains themselves. And you have the government who owns and regulates the rails that these trains run on. These private companies get told exactly how they need to run their business, exactly what they are and aren't allowed to do with these rails and their whole actual company. So they don't really have any proper decision making of their own. So when you say, how do we fix the rail systems? The rail companies say, no, we have no say in this, it's all the government. And the government say, no, we have no say in this, it's all the private companies. It's genuinely the worst of both worlds. Now, if Labour comes along and nationalises the rail system, Honestly, that might be an improvement short term because some things might actually be able to get done. Prices might actually be able to go under control. Regulation might actually be cut just so they can prove that they're doing a good job. But what it means long term is if in the hopefully near future, a right wing government comes in, they can simply privatise that nationalised entity. They can sell off all those assets to the highest bidder who can then manage it efficiently according to public demand. Right now, we can't do that. We can't look at that rail system and say, right, privatise all of this because most people think it's already privatised. And I think that running on this sensible, competent, centrist platform and being completely cut out of power for 14 years, when Labour win, they're going to think that they need to earn it. At least I believe they do. The Tories have been unbelievably entitled. They've won massive majority at the 2019 election and thought they can get away with anything. They thought they didn't have to bother actually implementing their policies. They can just piss about, do whatever they want, and make it up as they go along. That's why they're going to be absolutely annihilated, and I think Labour's going to learn a lesson from their enemies. I think they're going to at least try to actually pursue policies effectively. I'm not going to like those policies, but I'm going to at least admire that they can actually do something, because oh, we've been without that for a while. Next up, we have a bunch of minor parties. I'll get through those before I get to the most important party over the next five to ten years at the end, so you've got to wait for that. This right here is Ed Davey. He is the leader of the Liberal Democrats, and him being exposed, you can see right up his gusset into those budgie smugglers. That's him on the campaign trail. This isn't a photo that the paparazzi have taken of him on holiday. This is him right now. That is his campaign, and it's going to work. <laughs> So the Liberal Democrats and all these other minor parties have what I call sideliner superiority syndrome. That means that because they've never been in a real position of power, they've never made any mistakes, they've never done anything wrong, because they've never even had the chance to. That means that they and their centre-left centre voters get to wag their fingers at Labour saying, uh -uh, you shouldn't have done that, that was a mistake, because Labour have been in power a lot and have made a lot of mistakes because of it. And this sideliner superiority syndrome, I think, is the main reason why people will vote for them. Specifically, old people in the South. They get to think that they are anti-establishment by voting for the Lib Dems rather than Labour. And it's going to work. They are going to win a lot of seats in the English South, seats that they are taking away from Labour, which is very interesting and makes their life a lot harder. Greens. These are the Lib Dems for young people in the South. More sideliner superiority syndrome. They only get elected in very woke, very left-wing communist university cities such as Bristol and Brighton. And to tell you how unserious they are, they're called the Green Party and they hate nuclear power. No more needs to be said on that. They exist purely as ideological mouthpieces. They only care about promoting a woke agenda and again attacking Labour from the left. And we have yet more Labour vote splitters, this time along 
the grounds of Scottish and Welsh voters. More sideliner superiority syndrome. You'll hear the Scots in the SNP all the time say this is the fault of Westminster. What they mean by that is England. And they're a bit they're a bit interesting because there are separate parliaments in Scotland and Wales, devolved parliaments they're called. And so the SNP fills the green function in Scotland, but they are actually quite popular. They're just woke, they just hate Scottish people and their history and want to replace it all with foreigners. Plaid Cymru in Wales are more old-fashioned socialists. The modern history of Wales is industrial and post-industrial poverty. The place is in a very, very sorry state um, with lots of suffering, and they think that old-school socialism is the way to fix it. And, and you know what? At least they want something to actually properly change. Because the Labour Party in Wales, Welsh Labour is different to English Labour, and they are the, the woke lot. Plaid Cymru is an actual alternative to wokeness in that country, which is interesting. And something I find very funny, everybody's completely forgotten about Northern Ireland. I've not heard a single person mention the DUP or Sinn Féin. I don't know what that's about. Everyone's just forgot it exists. So, Labour are coming into power, and they have some massive, massive problems in front of them. First of all, being infighting. I mentioned Jeremy Corbyn before being uh, the Labour leader. His woke university communist student, his woke communist university students are still massively present in the party and they are an obstacle to his pursuit of sensible centrism. And this, this conflict often takes the form of pro-Israel and pro-Palestine people. So not only are they dealing with this massive infighting of the radicals and the centrists, they've also got all of that pressure from those minor parties that I mentioned. The minor parties only exist to make Labour's life significantly harder. And that not that going to be good? When I've said that they've got these economic policies that are bad, they're going to really struggle to get these passed, and hopefully the amendments they make don't actually just make it worse. This essentially means they're going to be running containment on the left for a very long time. I believe that any mainstream party, if it's nominally left-wing or nominally right-wing, looks in its own direction for threats. For 14 years, the Tories have been massively focused on UKIP, Brexit Party and reform, arresting people for racist tweets, crushing any views about nationalism or the importance of religion in social life while they continue to advance things like abortion. And very recently, the high-profile sentencing of Sam Millier, a man who posted stickers about immigration statistics in public. He is now in prison for it under the Tory government. That is what mainstream parties do. They worry about threats from their own side because they are actually the most threatening. So Labour's going to have to do the same thing from the left. And that means the light is going to be off of us. There's going to be a massive flourishing, I think, of the dissident right in this country without the spotlight on us, without the boot on our neck. It's going to be instead on the pro-Palestine communists within the left. Fantastic. Great news for us. One, our enemies actually suffer at the hands of the state for a change. Two, we can get away with a whole lot more. We can actually organise, we can actually hold events, we can actually publish things, perhaps under our real names, and get some actual work done. But the man of the hour is Nigel Farage. He is leading the Reform Party, who are absolutely storming in the polls right now due to a fantastic optics campaign and what I've called a no-nonsense determination, what I mean by that is they aren't distracted at all by things like Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine. They are simply looking at the national interest and how to fix the shit that, that the Tories have dug up in this country. So it is, I've, I've put here some cult of personality, it's entirely a cult of personality. When you, unless you live in Clacton, if you vote for reform, you're not voting for Nigel Farage, you're voting for a local representative. But the truth is, you are voting for Farage, you're making a statement when you vote for reform. Because they are massively rising on the right, and they are actually talking about serious issues. Uh, they've recently released their manifesto, and while obviously I want it to go further in pretty much every way, almost everything is moving in the right direction with their manifesto. I, I urge you all to read it. It's really, really exciting, and loads of people are going to support it. That is what makes me so excited and optimistic. 
the things that they are proposing you could not have proposed five years ago and they're doing it now with some serious popular support it's fantastic so because of the nature of first past the post and and the representative system in this country you're going to see reform get a lot of votes but only a handful of seats i think this is good for them I don't think they should bite off more than they could chew when they've only just actually come together and put together a manifesto. And Farage, while he may be, a, perhaps could be a competent prime minister, he would not have a competent cabinet as it currently stands. So they need a small amount of seats right now to develop, progress, get experience, and hopefully be a proper fighting force in the future. And they only recently announced Farage was the leader. Basically, a few weeks ago, this election, the only thing that excited me about it was how much we get to punish the Tories. But because he has massively stepped up onto the scene, he has rapidly changed what British politics is about in a matter of weeks. And this is truly, truly exciting because of him. And as part of their fledgling, what reform need to prioritise, which the Brexit party before it and UKIP before that were unable to, is a unity of people within its party in terms of a shared vision and shared goal of policy. But due to this new manifesto, which has come out since I wrote that bullet point, they could be on for a winner. If they want to be serious, they need to be united. Now, there are some problems with Nigel Farage. I was very hesitant when he claimed that he was running um, for, the, for Clacton. Now, I absolutely love the man. A, a guy who, in that photo right there, he's wearing... A hunter's tie, gingham shirt, tweed jacket, and barber coat, sipping a pint of ale. Any man who has ever done that even once in their life is a man after my own heart. Bloody love Nigel Farage. He's such a proper chap. Uh, he's hilarious. But he's got a bit of an iffy track record now. He used to do very well, but has developed what I've called snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. He basically single-handedly managed to get Brexit to pass in 2016 and get Britain to leave the European Union, and then just kind of left politics. He was the man of the hour, it was his moment to seize, and he just kind of gave up. He then came back and founded the Brexit Party when the Tories were cocking up Brexit in every possible way, and then just left. He just left the Brexit Party and left somebody else in charge, and then they've rebranded into reform. Now, when this election was announced... Nigel Farage said, I will not be running because it is more important for the sake of, I don't know, the Western world to focus on the American elections coming up. He wanted to go and grift in America instead. But enough people on Twitter, I think, called him a traitor and a coward for him to go, oh shit, maybe there actually is a chance for me here. And then came out with a storm and has been doing very, very well ever since. But he's left a sour taste in my mouth in that he was willing to give up the fight and just leave until people said we can make it worth your while. With his fickle track record that only adds to it, and the future of the mainstream right is entirely in this man's hands. That's concerning. He can wobble, he has shown this, he can leave when, it is, when he is most needed, and he is significantly needed right now with the collapse of the Tories. He is carrying the torch single-handedly. So let's think about the predictions that these things can tell us. Hopefully, the Tories can be shot into the sun with a comically large Looney Tunes cannon. Things can only get better. That was Tony Blair's campaign song and seems to be what Labour are going for as they come in. They're going to suffer at every turn. They're going to massively struggle uh, through internal threats and external. And if reform just keep doing exactly what they're doing right now for the next five years and then in the 2029 election they grow more mature they push in places with higher pressure and get more seats they can seriously massively change the course of british politics in such an unexpected way the co the potential course of this country's politics has radically changed in the space of weeks because of reform and farage and what they're doing i just don't want them to stop that's the main concern here so with all of this in mind, I think we've got at least 10 years of Labour down the line and in 10 years time, reform or maybe some sort of different shape of reform could come into power and massively change the politics of this country in a right wing di direction, which is absolutely fantastic. We might actually get the things that Conservatives promised us. We might actually get them in the form of reform. So I hope 
this shows why I'm so excited and optimistic about politics in this country. Yes, 10 years is a long time away and it's going to be a, still a rough 10 years. But after that, where could we be? The possibilities are endless. Rule Britannia. Britannia rules the stars. British space empire incoming. Anyway, take it easy. <laughs>